Hey, I'm Ryan, and welcome to Nest Hacker. In this episode, I'm going to show you how the NES stores, processes, and displays sprite graphics. Graphics programming on the NES can be a deep and somewhat complex topic, but once you grasp a few important concepts, it's not all that hard to understand. My goal for this video is to focus on the basics and explain how the NES produces sprite graphics. There are a lot of ways to proceed, but I think the best way is to start from the lowest level and work up from there. So I'll begin by explaining a bit about how the NES hardware works, then move on to how we manipulate that hardware to produce graphics for a game. But before we proceed, do me a favor by liking this video and subscribing to the channel. After that, we'll take a look at the chip behind those nostalgic 8-bit graphics. The main component that produces graphics for the NES is called the Picture Processing Unit, or PPU for short. The PPU is a specialized chip, developed by Nintendo, that works alongside the CPU as a coprocessor. This is analogous to the way that a graphics card works in a modern personal computer. Unlike the CPU, the PPU performs a fixed set of graphics operations and can't be programmed directly. Instead, it has its own set of memory that can be modified to change how it generates graphics. Roughly speaking, this memory space is broken down into four distinct sections. The first of the PPU sections contains the pattern tables, which hold the raw sprite image data for a game. There are two pattern tables, the left table and the right table, each of which have 64 kilobytes of memory, and together hold up to 256 8 pixel by 8 pixel tiles. As we discussed in previous videos, this section of memory is usually mapped directly to a cartridge's character ROM or character RAM chip. The next section contains the PPU's name tables, which are used to lay out the background graphics for a game. They're structured as a grid of 32 by 30 cells, each of which represents an 8 by 8 pixel region of the screen. Each cell is represented by a single byte, which refers to one of the tiles in the pattern table. The third section is used to store the active color palettes for a game. The PPU is capable of producing over 50 distinct colors, but it can't use all of those colors at the same time. Instead, this region is used to define up to 8 active palettes, containing 4 colors each. The final section is called the Object Attribute Memory, or OAM for short. This section of the PPU memory controls the foreground graphics for a game. These are things like Mario, Link, enemies, and effects like fireballs and explosions. Basically anything that sits above or sometimes below the background graphics. So putting it all together, you can think of the PPU as being controlled by these four distinct regions of memory. The pattern tables define the raw image data, the name tables set up the backgrounds, the palettes define what colors to use, and the OAM controls the foreground sprites. The PPU does have additional functions that can be controlled, but they're a bit advanced and I'll be dedicating entire videos to them in the future. For now, let's restrict the discussion to these four basic parts and dig into each of them a little deeper. But first, let's take a quick detour. I'd like to discuss the output signal that's generated by the PPU, and how that signal was used by old school CRT televisions. For those of you who don't know, CRTs are the original kind of television and the precursor to modern flat screens. They effectively consist of two basic components, a fluorescent screen and a cathode ray tube, thus the acronym CRT. The tube is basically a gun that shoots electrons on the screen, and when enough electrons hit a particular area of the screen, that area lights up. Further, CRT televisions came in two styles, either black and white or color. Black and white CRTs have a single electron gun that only controls monochromatic brightness, while color CRTs have three independent electron guns that control the proportion of red, blue, and green components to form a full color picture. For color TVs, these three beams would always move across the screen together. So when trying to understand how the technology works, it's easiest to think of them as being only a single electron beam. Starting from the top left, the television aims the beam so that it scans across the entire screen, row by row, until it reaches the bottom right. The gun is then repositioned to the top left and the cycle repeats indefinitely at a fixed interval, usually around 60 frames a second, but we'll get into that in a bit. As the gun moves, the rate at which the electrons is emitted is controlled by an external signal. This signal changes the brightness of the color at a given position, and since the gun is cycling so quickly, the result is an animated image. 
Classically, this signal would come from an RF antenna or cable box. But in the case of the Nintendo, the signal is actually generated by the PPU itself. There are actually two different types of signals that could be produced by an NES, depending on the region for which it was manufactured. For various reasons, the world actually developed two independent television standards, NTSC and PAL. NTSC was primarily used in the United States and Japan, and ran at 60 frames a second, with a total of 525 scan lines. PAL was primarily used in Europe, Africa, and South America, and ran at 50 frames a second with a total of 625 scan lines. Now, games were never programmed to be region-specific. The only thing that changed from region to region was the hardware on the console. Because the frame rates for PAL and NTSC were different, this meant that back in the day, games would run faster or slower, depending on where in the world you were playing them. A game is literally 17% slower when running on PAL in comparison to NTSC. This is a very noticeable difference and can actually have some ramifications for things like speedruns. Thankfully, both standards effectively do the same thing, control the intensity of the electron gun as it scans across the screen. So you can just focus on how the CRT works at a fundamental level and be aware that there's a very real difference between NTSC and PAL. Okay, so now that we've covered the low-level hardware of the NES and how CRTs work, let's dig into how we can manipulate the console's PPU memory to produce those awesome-looking 8-bit graphics. The sprite images that are stored in the PPU's pattern table memory form the basis for all graphics on the NES. These 8x8 pixel tiles of image data are composed together to form elaborate backgrounds, fast-moving characters, and a wide variety of special effects. At a fundamental level, the data for a sprite tile is structured much in the same way as a modern computer image, such as a PNG. Both formats are represented by a two-dimensional grid of numbers, with each value representing the color for a given pixel. But where a PNG can support millions of colors, an NES tile can only support four. And it goes even further than that. Technically, the tile doesn't store color data at all. The number that represents each pixel is actually an index that references a color in one of the system's active palettes. Palettes, as I talked about earlier, have a special place in the PPU's memory, and can be set up by the game's program by simply writing a series of bytes to that memory. The NES can store up to eight palettes at a time, four for the background and four for the foreground, and each of these palettes contains four colors. The first color for each palette, at index zero, isn't really a color at all. No matter what value the programmer sets, it'll always be interpreted by the PPU as the transparency color. When the NES renders a tile image, if it encounters a value of zero for a given pixel, it'll interpret that pixel as being transparent and just not render anything at all. Putting this all together, we see that sprites on the NES are formatted as a grid of numbers, with each number having a value from zero to three and representing a palette color index. A value of zero represents a transparent pixel for the sprite, while a value of one, two, or three represents a specific color in one of the PPU's palettes. Since pixels are limited to a value of 0 to 3, this means that they can be stored using only two bits. Doing the math, we see that each 8x8 pixel tile has 64 pixels and requires the use of 128 bits, or 16 bytes, of memory. Since the smallest amount of memory that the 6502 can reference is a byte, the developers had to get a little creative with how to store these 2-bit per pixel tile images. To see how they did it, let's take a look at a concrete example. So, here are four sprite tiles from the original Super Mario Bros. By arranging them in a specific way, using the correct palette and overlaying a grid, we can get a good view of how the tiles were composed by the game to form the classic Goomba. Recall that in the first level of the game, the Goombas are kind of a brownish color, and in the second level, they're more of a bluish color. The way this is accomplished is actually pretty straightforward. The developers simply switched the palette that was being used to render the sprites, depending on what level was being played. Let's take a look at how the data for these tiles is stored by focusing on the upper left-hand sprite of the composition. As I explained earlier, the sprite contains a grid of 8x8 pixels, with each pixel represented by a 2-bit color index value. Since the NES can't directly work with 2-bit numbers, it instead splits the value for each pixel into two separate parts, a low bit and a high bit. To store the image in pattern table memory, a game first stores the low bits as a run of 8 bytes. Immediately after, it then stores the high bits as another run of 8 bytes. 
Putting it all together, this gives us the expected 16 bytes of data for the tile image, but arranged in such a way that it can be easily manipulated by the CPU and correctly interpreted by the PPU. A pattern table for a game is effectively just a giant run of binary data formatted in this way. If you followed along with my previous video on how to set up an NES development environment, you've actually seen pattern data formatted just like this in the assembly file for the demo project. OK, so now that we've got a good grasp on how the NES stores and interprets sprite images and palettes, let's turn our attention to how to compose said images to form backgrounds for our games. As I mentioned in the overview, the PPU contains a special region of memory for holding what are called name tables. These name tables are just giant grids of bytes that reference tiles in the pattern table and are used to compose the backgrounds for a game. Name tables themselves are actually pretty simple. They're just grids of 32 by 30 tiles. Since each tile is exactly 8 by 8 pixels, this means that each name table represents a 256 by 240 pixel image that fills the entire screen. Each byte simply refers to a tile in the pattern tables, and since there are a maximum of 256 tiles, this means that a single byte can be used to reference any single one of them. A basic implementation for a game will simply store the bytes for an entire pattern table in the ROM, and then load them one after another into the PPU's name table memory. Once complete, the data for a background is effectively loaded, and the PPU can render the entire composition to the screen. For production games, it generally takes too long to re-render the entire name table between each frame, so most games use advanced techniques for storing and processing name table data so that they can update the backgrounds in real time without slowing down a game. As you can probably guess, these techniques are a bit out of scope for a basics video, but I plan on covering some of them in future episodes. At the end of each name table, there's a small region of memory called an attribute table. This is a grid of bytes that's referenced by the PPU to determine which palette to use when rendering the tile images in a name table. Compared to the name tables, the attribute tables are actually pretty complicated in how they're formatted, so I'll use an example to show you how it's done. OK, so here's a typical background from the game Dragon Warrior. Applying a grid to the image, we can see how the tiles are laid out in the name table. For reference, let's also take a look at the palettes that are loaded when the background is being rendered by the PPU. The palette selection for the graphics in the name table are being controlled by its associated attribute table. Each byte of the attribute table is split into four 2-bit segments, and each segment is used to select the palette for one of four 16 by 16 sections of tile data. For instance, the byte that controls this region of the screen uses the following bit values to select the palettes for the underlying sprite data. When set correctly, the name tables and attribute tables are used in conjunction by the PPU to render the final composite image. While somewhat complicated, when you break them down, both name tables and attribute tables are relatively straightforward. With the background graphics explained, let's move on to the final piece of the NES graphics puzzle, the foreground sprites. The foreground sprites for an NES game are controlled by a special region of PPU memory called the Object Attribute Memory, or OAM. In most online articles and tutorials, the entries in the OAM are often referred to as the sprites for a game. This is a bit unfortunate, since most non-technical sources refer to all NES graphics as sprites, which can lead to a bit of confusion for beginners. To avoid this, I generally use the term OAM sprite when I'm specifically talking about this region of PPU memory. The OAM can store data for up to 64 sprites at any given time, and each entry consists of 4 bytes. The first byte controls the vertical, or Y coordinate, for the sprite. The second byte specifies which tile to render from the pattern tables. The third byte controls a series of attributes for the sprite. And the last byte controls the horizontal, or X coordinate. The only really complicated part about all this is the third byte, which, similar to other parts of PPU memory, encodes multiple pieces of information in its individual bits. Bits 0 and 1 are used to select one of the foreground palettes for the sprite. The next three bits, 2 through 4, are unused and ignored by the PPU. Bit 5 controls whether to render the sprite above or below the background. If set to a 0, then the sprite will be rendered on top of the background. If set to a 1, then it will be rendered behind the background. Finally, bits 6 and 7 control whether or not to flip the sprite horizontally or vertically, respectively. If the control bit contains a 0, then the sprite is not flipped. If it contains a 1, then it is.
This is actually a pretty powerful feature, since it allows developers to save space in the pattern tables by creating horizontally or vertically symmetric characters and effects. Other than a few technical gotchas, along with some special use cases for the first sprite in the list, this is pretty much all there is to OAM sprite data. I'll be doing a whole episode about the ins and outs of OAM programming in the future, so I'll leave the topic here for now. Okay, so that's roughly all of the basic concepts behind how the NES processes and renders graphics for games. Let's drive it all home by looking at one final example and pointing out how each of the regions of memory are being manipulated to control how the PPU renders a scene. The Cutman stage of Mega Man 1 is not only iconic, it's also the perfect stage for our final example. Pausing the action, we see that there are quite a few things going on here, so let's break them down piece by piece. To start, we have the sprite images, or pattern data. A quick look at the pattern table memory will reveal a region jam-packed with all of the tiles that we need to render the entire scene. This includes the background, Mega Man, the enemies, and all of the special effects. The graphics for the background are being controlled by the PPU's name table memory. The name table specifies the tiles for the background by selecting an image for each of them from the pattern tables. The colors for the background are being controlled by the name table's associated attribute table in conjunction with one of the four selected background palettes. Both the background and the foreground palettes are controlled by selecting specific colors from the NES's system palette and writing the byte values for those colors directly to the PPU's palette memory. Finally, the PPU's OAM sprite memory is being manipulated to control the graphics for the characters and the effects on the screen. By composing multiple 8x8 tiles from the pattern table, the game builds up the full sprites for Mega Man, the enemies, and other foreground effects. Alright, so that about does it for an introduction to NES graphics. While there's a lot going on, and it's all based on some wildly old school tech, I think it's pretty easy to grasp once you break it all down. The hardest part for me, when I was first learning how to make NES games, was wrapping my head around how the attribute tables worked. So if you're struggling with any of the concepts that I introduced in this video, leave me a question in the comments and I'll do my best to answer it. Thanks for watching Ness Hacker. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Click the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post the next video on the channel. And if you have any questions or feedback, let me know in the comments.